Lord Jonathan Hill, former EU Commissioner for Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union, Minister of State Owen Murphy and Michael Jackson, Managing Partner at Matheson. Thank you for joining us here today at the House of Lords for our Brexit interview and we'll get straight into it. If I may start, Lord Hill, with you. You have said that there are not three people in this marriage, there are 28. How do you see the Brexit negotiations being approached by the UK in a constructive manner with the EU as we move forward now? I think the most important thing at this stage is that we uh, agree with our European friends on where we want to try and end up, that you do approach it constructively. I think some of the language in the United Kingdom isn't always very helpful. We have a very different political system in the UK which is quite conflictual. The language that we use, the way our media operates, uh, it's quite um, uh, aggressive language sometimes, which I think strikes some of my old friends in Europe as a slightly odd tone. So I think we should be starting by emphasising our common history, our common values, and actually try to set out what kind of partnership and friendship we can have in future. Lord Hill, with respect to the two-year negotiation period and a possible transitional period after that, what are the implications if the political process cannot keep up to speed with business and the business decisions which are being made now? Well, I think the political process has got to try and keep up with that. It's one of the things that I'm saying over here in the UK because businesses are having to make decisions every day and the facts are changing on the ground. And one of the things that strikes me very strongly when I talk to business in the UK is that they need to get on with things and they need to have certainty. And the political process, uh, which operates on a different time scale, I think needs to catch up uh, with where business is. Uh, because I think if for the whole of Europe we want to get through this process and deliver as much financial stability as possible, make sure all our European businesses get the funding that they need, and that funding comes from Europe, uh, we need to get on with it. Without the benefit of the EU financial services passport, do you think there is a real threat to the 75,000 city jobs as predicted in one of the recent surveys? Or how do you see the migration of financial services activity from the UK to other financial centres in Europe unfolding? Yeah. I think at the moment, and the only honest answer is it's quite hard to foresee what's going to happen because a lot will depend I think both on the substance of the negotiation and the spirit with which it is carried out. My own feeling, the sense that I have from talking to people around uh, the city, is that the mood there has been changing a bit, whereas I think before the referendum there was a very clear view uh, that leaving the single market would be extremely bad for the city as a whole. I think since then there's increasingly been a view that's more differentiated and different sectors have a different view and are more or less relaxed uh, about what the future might hold. And even within some sectors, like the banking sector, there are some banks, uh, depending how they're structured, who are more concerned about it than others. So I think the general feeling I have is that people don't want to leave London uh, and that I don't believe that it's going to be like a, uh, a switch flicking and that the City of London is going to migrate uh, to Paris or to Frankfurt or elsewhere. Uh, but clearly people have got to take the decisions um, that they need to take for their business and I'm sure they'll be looking at parts of the business that um, can be moved in the way that uh, they always have done. Minister Murphy, how do you anticipate the Ireland-UK relationship developing post-Brexit? And how important is Ireland's continuing commitment to the EU? Our continuing commitment to the EU is, is very important to us. We see our future in the single market. It's been a very important relationship for us since we joined, along with the UK, and we're going to continue in the European Union and continue to be a leader in the European Union as we look to the future. Obviously, we didn't want the UK to leave uh, the EU, but we respect that decision. And I don't see it having a major impact on our very strong and deep relationship with the UK. It's very important to us. It's been transformative for both countries, particularly in the last number of years. Of course, we have common concerns when we look at areas like Northern Ireland and the peace process and the institutions that guide that, the idea that there might be a hard border, which neither government wants to see return to the island, and the common travel area that we have that's been beneficial to workers in, in both parts, the UK and in Ireland. We do a huge amount of trade. 1.2 billion of goods and services are traded each week between the two countries. 
So there will be difficulties as a result of this decision to leave the European Union by the UK. But I believe that we can overcome them, and I believe that the strong relationship that we do have with the UK and that we do enjoy, that we're going to continue to enjoy that into the future. Minister Murphy, the Irish Central Bank has said that within its planning for this year, it has reflected the additional resources that it anticipates will be needed to deal with increased applications from UK-based financial services companies for authorisation in Ireland. What other considerations have been or are being taken into account in Ireland in order to support companies who are seeking to establish operations in Ireland as well as their UK-based operations in financial services? Well, I think from Ireland's point of view, we believe that London's going to continue to be a strong global financial centre. We think that's in the European Union's interest as well, that it does. But we have recognised that certain companies, because of their due diligence and their contingency planning, fear that they might not be able to continue to access the single market after Brexit. So they have come to Ireland and they've met with the central bank and they're looking about possibly relocating some of their business into Ireland to continue to have access to the single market. And as a result of that, the central bank has to reprioritise some of its staff and draw down extra resources, depending on what types of the industry or what parts of the industry might relocate. And I think that's important that they do that. Of course, our central bank is a very strong independent regulator. And a lot of the companies take a lot of comfort from that because they want to operate in an environment where the regulation is robust, where they're dealing with experts who can speak at their level. And so there is that security and stability in the, in the new market that they're coming in to, to operate in. Uh, but the government is looking at this across every spectrum of our contingency planning in terms of what we might need to do to make sure that we can facilitate and host these companies and the extra resources coming in. And that means, like everything, looking at staff in the central bank, looking at our international baccalaureate offering, which we are improving with a new school opening in the next couple of months for 800 pupils. We've got issues around capacity where we're addressing those in terms of transport, new linkages, a second runway for the airport. It's a dedicated housing minister now and a housing authority that's opening up new land banks to put in those additional resources in terms of accommodation, but also office blocks. And actually, when you look at office space, we have 3.5 million square feet under construction at the moment, another million square feet under refurbishment and planning permission for another 5 million square feet as well. So if we're going to see relocations out of the UK, we say that Ireland is a natural location of choice because we have all this planning put in place to accommodate firms relocating. Obviously, as well, we're a common law jurisdiction, which makes it easier to, to move people across, you know, English-speaking country as well. So, so natural benefits for companies, not just UK companies as well, but, but companies who've chosen the UK as their gateway into the single market, but are from other parts of the world, particularly uh, in Asia and the Far East. They can now see a, a much easier environment to relocate into versus other jurisdictions in the European Union to continue to have that single market and have that access, but also to have a strong presence here in London. And Michael, what are your views on that in terms of the idea of the preparations that can be made in Ireland? One of the more important messages that Ireland has been delivering is the message that for Ireland this is about partnership rather than a predatory engagement. And I think, as Lord Hill has mentioned, UK firms don't necessarily want to move out of London. It is very important that the engagement and dialogue is constructive and that where they feel they need to move from London, they can be satisfied that their needs will be met where they move. Ireland's approach differs from some other jurisdictions in that we're attempting to approach this in a partnership way rather than in a predatory way. And I think that's something that is welcomed by a lot of the clients that we speak to in London. They are looking for certainty of access to markets. They are looking for certainty of access to skills. They are looking for certainty of financial and uh, fiscal treatment. And they are looking for certainty of access to infrastructure. And for all the reasons that the minister has just outlined, Ireland's history of regulating passporting entities, its history of defending its tax rate, its history of having a skilled labour force. And we hear some interesting anecdotes from our clients that their Irish employees in London are very anxious to avail of an opportunity to move back to Ireland if, if, if necessary. For all of those reasons, we think that Ireland is well prepared to facilitate the gradual shift, and I believe it will be a gradual shift, of activity from London to Dublin. Michael, regarding your clients and the trends that you are seeing right now on the market, what are the key issues which are identifying themselves as, I suppose, the most important for your UK-based clients at this time? The primary issue for clients who are looking at their options is whether there will be certainty of access to markets. Uh, they don't necessarily want to move large chunks of their business, but they need to move those parts of their business which require continued guaranteed access to the European Union. 
And that's why the Irish government's ongoing, clearly stated commitment to Europe is very, very important to our clients. The second thing our clients are looking for is to minimise disruption. They want to do things in a way that minimises disruption for their own internal business and for their clients as far as possible. And so looking at ways in which they can manage the transition that's going to be necessary in a way which minimises disruption is very, very important to them. And that means dealing with a regulator who speaks their language, not just literally, but in terms of understanding their business and understanding their business needs. Our clients are looking for certainty of regulation, but sensible regulation. And they're also looking for access to infrastructure and access to skills. I look out of my office window, I see more cranes than I've seen in a very long time. Uh, I look at Dublin Airport and the development that's happening there. The Dublin to London route is one of the busiest routes in Europe and Ireland continues to add additional connectivity through Dublin Airport. So all of those things are very important to our clients, but the most important thing for them is that they're working in an environment which minimises the disruption to their business and to their clients. And Lord Hill, looking across the Atlantic and Prime Minister Theresa May's recent visit to the White House and to meet President Trump, what is the likelihood of the prospect of agreeing a UK-US trade deal and what might be the realistic timing on that? I think two things about that trip. I think first of all, the uh, importance of the um, under underwriting the guarantee that she secured from President Trump about support for NATO was extremely important for the whole of Europe. And I think that illustrates the point that if we think of the future relationship between the UK and the EU in a positive way, you can find things that we've got in common that we need to work on together to achieve, rather than talking the whole time about things that divide us. And I think if you can get into that uh, mindset, then the process of leaving will be less disruptive than it otherwise might be. So far as the trade deal is concerned, uh, I think it's clearly the case that President Trump wants a different approach to trade, that the multilateralism of the past, regional deals that people have been doing for some time, he wants to move away from and he clearly wants to do bilateral deals. And I think as a deal maker uh, by, by background, uh, he will want to crack on with a free trade deal with the UK. Uh, obviously it can't be concluded till after we've left. So I, th I think there clearly will be something, but what its scope will be and the scale of it, the ambition of it, not yet possible to say. But I, I, I think the intent to deliver something rapidly, for him as well because of the broader message it will send about his approach to diplomacy, so I think we can expect to see something in a fairly short time scale. Lord Hill, following the recent interventions by not one but two former Prime Ministers warning of the costs of Brexit and the possibility of a, of a second vote, another vote, how would you respond? Well, first off, everyone's got a right to express a view in this debate. So I'm not one of those who think that they shouldn't be allowed to say what they think. What I do think, though, is that any thought or talk about a second referendum uh, is completely mad. Uh, I know that in Ireland you've had second referendum. But here, we did not say to the British people, this is, let's hear your opinion, this is an advisory referendum, and if we don't like the answer, we'll have another look. You know, we don't do referenda very often in the UK. We said to everyone, this is the biggest decision that you're likely to make in your lifetime. I was a Remainer, but I think you have to accept the result that the people delivered. And I don't think it was uh, an accident. I don't think it was a fluke. So I think you have to accept it as a fact and then get on with it. The other reason not to have a second referendum is a practical point to do with how the negotiation might proceed. If you think the whole time that at the end of it there might be a referendum that puts the negotiation into question, why would my European friends be a, feel they can negotiate in good faith? How can the Brits negotiate in good faith? And what I basically feel is, whereas in Britain we're obsessed by Brexit, and understandably we think about it from our point of view, we've got to get on with our life. Europe's got to get on with its life. It's got to work out what it's going to do at 27. It's got big issues that it needs to grapple with. So I have a very simple, pragmatic view 
which the thing has happened. And in life, when things happen, whether you like them or not, the better thing is to get on with, to face them, to front up to them and get through them. And the quicker you get through them, the better it will be for Europe, the better it will be for Britain, the better it will be for business, and the better it will be for everyone who gets on with the rest of their lives. And finally, some crystal ball gazing. Lord Hill, you have noted that the polarised nature of the political and media debate to date on all of this is making things harder. How would each of you rate, from where we're standing now, the likelihood of success of the Brexit negotiations? I'm hopeless at percentages. What I do know is that the people I talk to in Europe, the overwhelming majority, want to sort this out in a way that uh, it makes as much sense for all of us as we can. No one wants to cut off both our noses to spite our face. And I think if we go about it in a sensible way, we can come out the other end with a different relationship, but one that still works for Britain and for the EU. Minister Murphy? Well, I mean, as I look at it, failure is not an option. And to echo what Lord Hill said, if we approach this as a zero-sum game, we're going to come to a very difficult and maybe a disorderly outcome. But if we realise that we can come through this and have beneficial outcomes for both sides, then we could get to a positive place at the end of the process. And we don't know at the moment where we're going, but if we can make sure that we keep order and pragmatism around the negotiations, I think we can get there in a successful way. And Michael? I think if clear economic thinking dominates the discussions, then it will be obvious to everyone that a strong UK and a strong Europe trading together is in the best interest of everybody and we'll have a successful outcome to negotiations. I think if other issues start to dominate the debate, then that becomes more difficult to achieve. And I do worry that the two-year time frame provided for in Article 50, which is shorter than the average length of time it takes an EU directive to get through the legislative process, and much shorter than the average length of time it's taken to negotiate trade deals up to now, that that short time frame will militate towards other issues dominating the discussion. So hopefully the process can be one which reduces that risk and as the Minister and Lord Hill have said, enables people to get together in a constructive way to make sure that we do the best thing for everybody. Well, we'll wrap it up now. A sincere thank you to each of you for joining us here today for our Brexit interview and for sharing your expertise and insights with us. Thank you.